Our speaker today is Debbie Rodriguez, and Debbie is a member of the Long Beach Unitarian Universalist Church, and she has been a UU since 1992. She was previously a Peace Corps volunteer in Bolivia, and while serving there, she met her husband, who was an artist. She is married with two children. She is going to talk to us today about organizing as a spiritual practice. I think it takes a certain amount of creativity, to, of creativity to be organized. For some of us, it takes a lot of creativity to be organized. And so this um, topic fits nicely with our theme for the month. So please welcome Debbie Rodriguez. Organizing wasn't always my passion, it was my prison. <laughs> and if it wasn't for a service on organizing that I presented earlier this year, I wouldn't have given it much consideration. I presented the service at um, our church, the Unitarian Universalist Church of Long Beach. But in this last year, uh, I've come to understand that li my lifelong journey from organizing has gone from prison to passion with a brief detour through rebellion. It's a thread that I seem to have discovered was woven through my entire life in one way or another. I've spent decades of my life alphabetizing my spices and anything else that allows itself to be organized uh, and alphabetized, creating three ring binders to manage projects. Uh, our house is, I buy them by the box and developing a complicated calendaring system that lets me track all the projects our busy family's working on, our interests, and the other activities a busy family engages in. I've probably spent more time of my, more of my life at Staples than on vacation. <laughs> the people at the Staples store on PCH near our house uh, know me by name. In January, Reverend Mitra, who I understand was your uh, minister for a year, uh, she's our minister, we love her, she invited me to take a worship creation class. A few other members of our congregation were invited to develop services for our church. She asked us to think about topics that we would like to give a service on. Um, what are you passionate about, she asked. I kept a list of themes that I thought were noble themes in my notebook. and. Um, and, you know, such as art and beauty and my Peace Corps service. Um, and then organizing kept popping up saying, hello, hello, organizing. And I kept saying, I don't think you're a very noble issue. But it wouldn't leave me alone. So I shared with the class when we all shared what our themes were, what our topics we were thinking about giving a service on um, was. And I said, this is kind of goofy, but it keeps popping up. So I'll just put it out there. Um, organizing not like in organizing for social justice, but in organizing our underwear drawers. <laughs> Mitra chuckled with everybody else, and she said, um, why don't you hold a space for it and explore what it is calling you to consider? So we did, a part, we did an exercise in that class with another partner, David Raiklin, who's a wonderful member of our congregation, and I were paired up, and we started sharing. And at the end of that sharing, we did a little exercise where you talk seven minutes about your topic without stopping. And then, um, then the other person, you wait a couple minutes and they give feedback and then you talk five more minutes and then you get feedback and some questions. And so at the end, David said, Debbie, this is not a goofy topic. It is a f profound topic. So I felt so much better and I felt, okay, now I can move forward. I see why in talking about my topic and being asked questions, uh, why it was so important to me. So I'm offering this service as a noble and profound topic. Uh, it's not about sharing organizing tips, uh, you know, like if you snip the corners of your calendar, when you open it, you can just stick your finger right in and open up to today because that saves you. I have the actual calculation number of X number of hours. Um, it's not about how easy you can find your spices because they're organized and alphabetized. Um, but if you'd like tips like that, just see me after the service. <laughs> or if you have some juicy ones that I might not know about, let me know. 
Most importantly, when I shared that I was doing this service with a couple people at our church, their first reaction was guilt or judgment. Oh, my God, I'm not organized. Oh, my God, I'm so horrible at organization. Oh, my God, I'm going to go and just feel so guilty. This is not a call to guilt or judgment. This is a call to mindfulness and something we already do and participate in in our everyday lives. If we have to put away the dishes or fold our underwear or pay our bills, why not engage in this work as a way to connect to our soul? That's what I'm looking forward to sharing today. In the Hindu tradition, there's an idea that you call upaguru, the guru next to you. This means that anything is ha- that is happening in your life at that moment can be your teacher if you have the right attitude. By paying attention to our things, our calendars, our energy, our things that need to be organized and sorted, our environments, organizing can be our upaguru. I hadn't considered organizing more than just a habit that made my life easier and gave me comfort in knowing that I'm not missing appointments and I'm keeping track of things that I need to be kept track of, um, that I can find things easily, and that I'm doing something each day to create a better life for myself and my family and my community. I was curious what it was about organizing that was calling me to explore its deeper meaning. When I started my research, I did what every researcher does. I went to Google and I typed in the practice of organizing and 140 million search results came up. (laughs) Then I typed in organizing as a spiritual practice, and three results came up. So when you get three results, I typed it in the other day, and you get a whole lot more now, but this was a year ago. So when you get three results in Google, you know you've typed it wrong, (laughs) or you haven't adequately expressed the idea. So I clicked on the three, the three uh, items that were that were linked, and the spirit of organizing, the prelude uh, from the book that I read from earlier this year, was there, and a couple other. One was a spiritual practice through the Jewish tradition, and another one was I can't remember what the other one was. It was a um, it was a column in a magazine, but I don't remember the specifics about it. But I went to Amazon and I previewed um, the spirit of organizing, uh, and as I was reading it. I saw myself, I devoured every read, you know, on Amazon you can flip pages and, you know, every preview surprised me, I clicked on every single thing and so I clicked on um, order the book and I ordered the book and it's the only book I've ever paid, you know, special shipping prices to get as fast as as I could, as fast as I could. Um, You know, as I was reading it, I was like, oh my gosh, that's what I do, that's who I am, that's why I do that. Before reading that book, The Spirit of Organizing, I had read many books on organizing, uh, and as many as I could get my hands on. I acquired my first one when I was 17, and it had just and it had just graduated from high school. I remember going to B. Dalton Bookseller in the Glendale Galleria. Do you, anybody remember B. Dalton Bookseller? <laughs> and I went to the Glendale Galleria, and I spent my gift certificate from my graduation. This was before the days of gift cards. And I saw Stephanie Winston's book, Getting Organized. I bought it, and I read it cover to cover, and I was intrigued. Even though I already did some of the things, I, you know, I just kept finding out more and more and just having a deeper understanding about better and more efficient ways. Organizing prior to that had always been, in my home, had always been the prison, as I spoke about earlier. I hadn't seen the benefits of organizing. I had only seen the limitations that it had on my life that had been imposed by strict, rigid, and suffocating, a a strict, rigid, and suffocating way it was imposed in our home by my mother. A little bit of my family background. My dad inherited an alcohol addiction and wasn't home often. When he was home, there there was tremendous conflict. Uh, in my home with my mom. She, they were raising four kids, working, trying hard to maintain the image of a perfect family. And organizing was the way my mom could create that perfect image. The message we got was that if everything was clean, organized, and perfect, then too could our lives be. We maintained the perfect house, a perfect image, and were required to maintain the perfect story. I see now that this was the way in which my mother's fears were assuaged through control of her own world. 
She controlled her world, her environment, her children, and her life. She rarely sat still. She was always cleaning, organizing, and ordering everything, including my life, my things, and my time. There was nothing that was mine that was exclusively mine to manage except my imagination. I almost always walked around with a book or a sketch pad. I read a lot and drew a lot. Through words and lines, I imagined a different life, one with freedom and choice. To give you an idea of how organizing worked in our house, we had to fold our underwear, the right side and then the left side, and then fold it in half and pile it in a pile. Now, my mom could tell if we had folded the left side first and then the right side and then folded it. So if we had done that, or if we, our piles weren't perfectly organized, when we got home from school, our drawers would be on our bed, and we would have to refold everything and put them in our drawer. And our closet had to be ordered by like short sleeve shirts, and then long sleeve shirts, and then skirts, and then pants, and then jackets. And then if we didn't have anything that if was if it wasn't in that order, anything that wasn't in order would be on our bed, and we'd have to put it all put it back in in the proper order. It was important to fold and sort and organize everything, towels, clothes, and every textile in our house actually, um, the way that mom needed it to be. Uh, we also had to line up at the door each morning before we left for school. And my mom checked our fingernails. So we had to show our fingernails that they were clean. She checked if we'd brushed our teeth. And she checked, this might be the most times anybody said underwear in your pulpit. <laughs> and she checked to make sure if we put on clean underwear. Now, I don't know how she did that, but I guess the honesty system worked. So we had to, so we, you know, so she checked our underwear. We couldn't go out of the house and just you know, regular clothes or ripped clothes or torn clothes or wrinkled clothes. We had to go out. We were required to wear perfectly pressed, clean, ironed clothes to leave our house. It saddens me to think about what kind of person or what kind of prison it was for my mom to live with the notion that she had to be perfect and have a perfect family. I wonder about all the things she missed out on because of her preoccupation with order and her fear, the tremendous fear she must have felt from falling short of perfection. She grew up in the countryside near Albuquerque. She was the first one of her siblings to move to the city. She met my dad when he was stationed at the Air Force Base in Albuquerque. My dad, he was the eldest of a dozen children and had escaped the alcoholism and abuse in his home uh, by joining the military. My grandmother, the situation was so horrible that my grandmother signed the paper for him to go early even though they lied about his age and she <laughs> willingly knew that he lied and helped him get in. He lived deep in the, they lived deep in the beautiful mountains of, Kentucky, of, ten, of Tennessee and since my dad wasn't interested in school and it was too difficult to live with my grandfather, he took the option that he felt he had which was to join the military. Once they married, their two disparate worlds collided and my dad escaped into his addiction and my mom escaped into her addiction of control and order. When I was growing up, obsessive compulsive disorder and obsessive compulsive personality disorder weren't on society's radar. It wasn't until the early 1900s that they were even articulated by Freud and even then they didn't come into you know, household conversation until decades later, 80s, 90s. Um, obsessive compulsive disorder and obsessive compulsive personality disorder are highly complex diagnoses, but one of the main differences is that those with OCD know they have difficulties and suffer related stress because of that. And those with OCPD, the personality disorder, believe they, the way they live is the right way to live, is a quote from one of the literature, pieces of literature I read, suitable and correct way to live. Both diseases have overlapping symptoms and it's not important to diagnose my mom or myself, um, but it's important to see how this pattern of behavior contributed to my evolution. When I was doing the research, there are five subtypes of compulsive personality disorders that are curious. Um, conscientious, bureaucratic, puritanical, parsimonious, and bedeviled. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you which one I think I might be, but it, it's not the bedeviled one. My mom 
was not willing to entertain questions from her children. She was not able to connect with us because of her need for cleanliness, order, and control. I felt suffocated and stifled in our household system. I felt pressure to adhere to the strict, rigid rules in our house, and I felt isolated from the world. The day after high school graduation, I left home. In my little cottage apartment in La Crescenta, I had my first encounter with my post-living-at-home life. I moved my things in and was so excited that I had a place of my own. I felt so free, the biggest sense of freedom I'd ever felt. I was now going to keep my underwear, my clothes, my dishes, everything I owned how I wanted to. I was no longer going to abide by rules that I had no input in creating. I would now keep my things the way I darn well pleased. When I would go home from work, I'd go to hang my clothes up and then I'd think, oh wait, I'd have to hang that up, so I threw it on the floor. <laughs> I would go eat, go eat in my kitchen with my dishes and then I'd go to wash it immediately and then, I'd, oh wait, I'd have to wash that, so I'd just pile it up. It was not a very, you know, a very cleanly, sanitary way of living. My once charming space became pretty oppressive. It was uh, when all the dishes were in the sink one day and I was climbing over my clothes to get in my apartment. I said, I think this is enough. I can't live like this. I choose not to live like this. I hadn't re rebelled against my parents. I had rebelled against my apartment. I lived in what eventually became squalor for a couple months. And when I said enough, I started seeing things as they really were. The dishes were in the sink piled up in a penicillin experiment. My closet, <laughs> closet was empty. It was like, served like an extra room. Huh. I cleaned up my charming little apartment, hung up my clothes, washed the dishes, and folded my towels and sheets whichever way they were asking to be folded and threw them in a cupboard. But most importantly, I asked, how do I want to live? I came to realize that organization didn't have to be oppressive. It could actually be helpful. It could be a means to live the way I wanted to live. It could be my choice. I kept exploring how I wanted to live and comparing that with how I had lived. I refined my habits as I went along. Stephanie Winston's book became my Bible, and I purchased and checked out every book from the library and from the Dalton Bookstore and the other ones um, about organizing that I could find. I read and implemented all the ideas that struck me. I clipped the corners of my calendar. I put items in the same drawer that were similar so I could find them easily. I found myself alphabetizing my spices. I bought three ring binders and sorted and organized everything. I carried around a three-hole puncher in my handbag with me and a stapler. <laughs> Had a heavy handbag back then. I bought every office supply that at that time Savon sold, and I actually used them. I became an organizing evangelist. I purchased my first calendar system when Franklin Covey opened their first door. By then I was living in Cincinnati. I went to their time management classes and implemented everything. I adjusted my organizing system frequently to gain efficiencies and manage all the things I was interested in and all the activities I participated in. I used efficiency and order to advance my career. I had become an accountant because I was too shy to talk. Um, and I know those of you who know me, or well, in, at our church, when I said that, there was a large chuckle because I not shy any longer. Um, I remained an accountant. I realized it wasn't my calling early on, but I remained an accountant because it was the perfect profession for an organizing nut. Talk about office supplies. <laughs> organizing helped me live better. It helped me program all the things I wanted to do with my life. It allowed me to create a lovely functional place to live and work. In the early 90s, as Connie has shared, I joined the Unitarian Universalist Church in, Law in Cincinnati, and I signed up for a class, Writing Your Spiritual Autobiography. Some of you might have taken that class. Um, and one day in class, our minister asked, who is your God? Well, I grew up Catholic, so I didn't understand the question, because I thought, well, don't we all have the same God? But I wasn't sure, because I had just become UU. People went around answering, and I didn't understand, so I passed. And then after a meeting, 
a while later, she said, Debbie, efficiency is your God. It's what you would be willing to die for. I thought about this and tried to assess if I was too concerned with organizing or if it was just something that I was good at. While single and living alone, it didn't seem to matter so much, and I continued to maintain my highly efficient life. But that stuck in the back of my mind. Since I had been so controlled and restricted growing up, I signed up for every class which interested me. I went to concerts, talks, meetings, and pursued anything I thought sounded like fun, sometimes attending three or four events in a single day. I managed it all on my Franklin Planner system that I had modified through my, re through my reading in my burgeoning organizing library. I taught coworkers how they too could do their work, uh, do the work of another employee and never miss another deadline. I was asked by my employers to give coworkers classes on time management and organizing, and um, I became an efficient, effective, hyper-organized human being and human doing. Then I got married. And did I mention? I think Connie mentioned my husband is an artist. <laughs> so after the honeymoon, it was apparent that we had some negotiating to do about our physical space. I'll have to admit, some of those negotiations were that originated in my camp, perhaps were a bit loud and maybe a bit angry. My husband, Ramon, grew up in the countryside of Bolivia, and he didn't have a bathroom to keep tidy. He had an outhouse. His kitchen was the great outdoors. There were no tile counters to maintain clean or grout to scrub with a toothbrush. It was a stark contrast to how I lived. I had inadvertently become my mother. I had to take a look at what was important to me and our family and assess what I could let go of. It was hard, but I stopped alphabetizing my spices, towels. They didn't have to be folded all the same way. The paperwork and color-coded files labeled by category no longer had to be done like that. I tried to let go of how I thought my house and file drawers should look and accept that we are a creative family under construction and there will be dust, cobwebs, and a few tears along the way. Unfound folders, <laughs> unfiled papers, and those will all be within the imperfect lives we lead. We try our best to consider everyone's needs and create a household wherein everyone thrives. Me, my husband, and our two teenagers. If the dishes can be in the general vicinity of the kitchen, that'd be really nice. <laughs> if I can find what I'm looking for quickly, even better. I have daily opportunities to practice being kind versus being right. When I'm searching for the lid for a pan, I can challenge the compulsions that arise when I feel like everything needs to be perfect. I can accept that things can be messy and disorganized, and as Orba the Greek says, embrace full catastrophe living, <laughs> which it is, I guarantee that. Our philosophy on organizing and raising a family, I hope, is based upon the needs of each member of our family, the unique gifts and talents we each bring to our world, and the way we can support each other in reaching towards our higher purpose in the world. In her book, It's Hard to Make a Difference If You Can't Find Your Keys, Marilyn Paul, <laughs> I recommend it, Marilyn Paul suggests becoming organized enough to live a far more rewarding life and make the difference that is most important to you. Often we keep things in a state of messiness because we're too afraid to look at our lives. But what if we took a look at our lives? What if we found a system that works for our own life, be it piles on our desk, immaculate color-coded files, or even smoke signals. One that helps you stretch into your personal best. And maybe instead of judging our lives by how organized we are, we could assess them by how much we learn, how much joy we experience, how relaxed we feel, how connected we are, how we have served others and served ourselves. And we could ask ourselves, have I cultivated harmony? Have I cultivated ease? Have I cultivated confidence? Have I cultivated grace? 
Andrew Mellon says, being organized isn't about getting rid of everything you own or trying to become a different person. It's about living the way you want to live, but better. Whether you consider yourself extremely organized, moderately organized, or clueless about organization, I call you to consider incorporating organizing as a spiritual practice into your life. Next time you find yourself folding your underwear, ask yourself, am I willing to allow this humble act to be a bridge to the sacred within me? It is a noble and profound practice.